Today, um, I'm going to talk about um, a low rank uh, approximation in electron uh, excitation calculations. Um, this is joint work with a lot of people in the last few years. Um, and this, is, this talk is to some extent, uh, you know, tutorial in, nat uh, in nature. And, uh, and I know that not everybody here works on uh, electron excitation. So I'm going to start with some very basic introduction on uh, electron uh, excitation study via uh, many body perturbation theory and linear response analysis. Uh, then I will focus mostly on um, try to um, use low rank approximation techniques to construct uh, the Hamiltonian for what's called beta cell Peter equation. Um, and, um, and I talk about uh, the spe spe specific technique called uh, interpolative uh, separable density fitting. And I'll give some examples to demonstrate the accuracy, both the accuracy and efficiency of this technique uh, in the context of solving the beta cell Peter equation. So, um, so what we're interested in here is a quantum many body system for a, um, um, uh, many electron system, you know, like uh, add, uh, molecules of solids. Uh, mathematically, as we all know, this is typically uh, described by um, a many body Schrodinger's equation, which is an eigenvalue problem, um, h psi equals psi ei. Uh, e, uh, where e is the eigenvalue and psi is the eigenfunction, so these are many body wave functions. And I specifically label um, the number of electrons in, for the system as n. Uh, and the Hamiltonian, um, many body Hamiltonian looks like this, which has the kinetic energy terms and potential energy and so on and so forth. Um, so, and the eigenvalues are ordered, you know, in an increasing order with um, E0 being the ground state. You know, that's where the molecules and solids typically stay in. Uh, and then you have higher energies, which corresponds to uh, excited states. Um, these excited states can be reached um, by basically perturb the system um, with some external uh, perturbations, fields, for example, in the sort of what's called the photo emission uh, spectroscopy study. Um, the system uh, can be perturbed by some photon, photon source um, to knock out, for example, one electron from the system. And the kinetic energy of this electrons can be measured. And that allows you to deduce basically the excitation energy, which is basically the difference between the excited, sta excited states for n electron, uh, n minus one electron um, system ion, and the, the original n electron system uh, at the ground state. And then you can uh, use this uh, sort of um, experiment um, to actually get the um, the energy uh, momentum dispersion curve, um, this is typically done through this what's called angular resolved uh, photo emission uh, spectroscopy, RPAS, and, and that ultimately allows you to actually obtain the, the band structure of uh, the material. Um, so this is one type of excitation um, uh, that uh, people often study. And another type of uh, uh, electron excitation is what's called neutron excitation. So the molecules or, or solids can absorb uh, a photon um, and then uh, promotes an electron from uh, what's called occupied uh, state to an unoccupied state. Um, so um, so this, the electron will stay within the system. The system stays neutral. Uh, and then you can actually um, study this. Um, basically, that will give you um, a what's called optical absorption curve. And the position of these peaks basically gives you the excitation energy. So the amount of energy it takes to excite the system um, from one state to uh, another. So um, of course, in theory, I mean, so this is, these are experiments. But in theory, um, you can calculate all these excitation energies by basically solving this uh, many body Schrodinger equation by computing the eigenvalue. If you can do that. And then you basically take the differences between excited states and, and ground state, and, and, and you can get the excitation energy. And of course, we know that um, this is uh, uh, prohibitively expensive for a system with more than a few electrons. So, um, so um, another way, an alternative way to study um, the sort of electron excitation is to focus on um, 
you know, some kind of low dimensional observables. Um, so, um, and this is, um, you know, one of those observables is, is called Green's function, right? So, what the uh, one particle Green's function is essentially um, the expectation value of basically the, what's called the creation annihilation operator, okay, written here in um, the sort of a, a Heisenberg picture. Um, so, what you can look at this is basically you can think of, think of this as um, electrons. Um, so you apply a creation operator on the ground state wave function, okay, and then propagate that wave function uh, by this exponential of the Hamiltonian from T1 uh, from T2 to T1, okay, and then apply annihilation operator to annihilate electron um, to get another wave function. Take the and then take the inner product. Of that wave function with the with the ground state, um, and then you can you know this phase factor is not that important, um, and then you have to you know this things depending on whether t one is greater than t two you know there's this some kind of a time ordering issue here but that we can ignore, um, so you can also interpret this um, as essentially the, this uh, one particle Green's function as um, the probability of uh, measuring um, the presence of electron when uh, electrons at, at one uh, r one and t one when an electron is added r at r r two t two, okay. So uh, so this is one of the observables that we can study, and then you can also for the so this is for basically ionization uh, excitation for uh, neutral excitation where electron is promoted from occupied state to a an occupied state. Um, and creating what's called uh, an electron hole pair, um, we study basic, uh, in that case, we study a two particle Green's function for the electron hole pair. Um, and you can write down a Green's function, a similar a Green's function for two particle excitation. Um, so um, now the reason that we can actually um, calculate the excitation energy uh, from these Green's function. Um, follows from this uh, observation that these Green's function, um, after you take in the Fourier transform um, with respect to, I should mention that when the Hamiltonian is um, time independent, um, this Green's function is actually, uh, even though I have T1 and T2 here, uh, the Green's function in real time is actually a function of the time difference. Okay? So if you take a, a, a Fourier transform uh, with respect to the time difference, and then use you know, some kind of a, a resolution identity trick, um, you can actually express the, um, the Green's function, single particle Green's function, as the sum of a bunch of rational functions um, that, has posed, uh, that have posed at the excitation energy. Okay? So, um, so in the real space, I mean, in the, in, the, in the time domain, of course, this will be a sum of exponentials um, with frequencies at, um, at these ex uh, excitation energy. But in the frequency space, you basically have a bunch of rational functions with pose at, this, um, uh, at the uh, excitation energy for single particle. And then for the two particle, uh, you can, one can actually write down what's called a response function in terms of the uh, Green's function. Um, and do some linear response analysis, and then ultimately also can express the, the response function for uh, the two particle as a sum of rational functions where the poles are at um, lambda i and uh, a minus lambda i, and these basically correspond to, to the excitation energies and, and all the de-excitation energies associated with this uh, particle hole creation process. Okay, of course, you know, um, these Green's functions originally were defined in terms of the expectation values of these the creation, operate, uh, creation annihilation operator, but we, in computationally, uh, we don't actually want to work with the many body wave function, right? So we want to work directly with the single particle uh, Green's function. Uh, it turns out that um, through um, many body perturbation analysis, if you apply the many body perturbation analysis on the, on the uh, Green's function defining terms of the expect expectation, um, you can write down uh, what's called a Dyson's equation. You can write down a, a set of equation of motion uh, satisfied by these Green's functions. Um, they look like uh, a differential, uh, you know, integral equations. Um, and if you prefer matrix notations, 
uh, the Dyson's equation uh, looks like this, where G is the Green's function, and this is G0 is some kind of a Green's function for non interacting system. And these um, Dyson's equation include this term called self energy, which is a, a, a energy term that sort of um, is a, a um, um, the energy electron ex uh, exert on itself through its interaction with you know many other electrons. Um, so um, this is a sort of a nonlinear uh, sort of a system that you have to, to solve, um, and it's frequency dependent. Um, typically, so our goal is to try to figure out the, the pose of these Green's functions, right? So these pose corresponds to the excitation energy. Um, and one way to actually try to capture these pose is to look at the inverse of the Green's function, which is some kind of a Hamiltonian, and, and basically try to find the eigenvalue of these Hamiltonian, and they will correspond to the pose of the Green's function. So um, for um, one particle uh, excitation, basically what we need to do is to solve this, um, this nonlinear eigenvalue problem where the Hamiltonian actually depends on the uh, eigenvalue you try to compute. So this is the ex excitation energy. And depending on what kind of approximation, so this self-energy has to be approximate. There's no explicit uh, form because um, you know, it involves perturbation a lot of different terms. Usually people make some selections on which terms to keep. And, and that, you know, they correspond to some like, you know, GW approximation you may have heard of. Um, um, similarly, for two particle excite, uh, Green's function uh, or response functions, you can um, work with the inverse of that, which gives you a eigenvalue problem. Uh, it's called the beta Salpeter equation. Okay. Um, so, for the, so I'm going to focus on the beta Salpeter equation for, for the rest of this talk. Um, so this equation, um, it's an eigenvalue problem. It's not a many-body system, but still it is, um, it, it is somewhat difficult, I mean, somewhat expensive to calculate because the dimension of the system, because we have two particles involved, um, is um, basically proportional to uh, the number of occupied states times the number of um, unoccupied states. Both of them are proportional to the number of electrons. So this beta Salpeter Hamiltonian has this two uh, by two block structure. Um, each block, the dimension of each block, you can think of it as uh, Ne square, where Ne is proportional to the number of electrons. Okay? So the dimension can become rel uh, very quick, uh, very large very quickly for a relatively large system. And then if you were to diagonalize, try to find the eigenvalues of this um, problem, and that, you, you know that's basically a conventional algorithm is order n to the third with respect to the dimension of the problem, and which is order n to the sixth with respect to the number of electrons for this problem. So um, this, this Hamiltonian does have some structure. Um, so the diagonal blocks is basically a sum of these um, d's and va and wa. So the D is relatively simple. They're just, it's a diagonal matrix that contains basically the differences of energies uh, between uh, here written as the conducting band energy and uh, valence band. And these are typically uh, calculated either from um, single, particle, uh, single particle Green's function, uh, as these are as the pose of the single particle Green's function, or sometimes taken as basically a mean field calculation, like you know, uh, a DFT calculation. Um, so the, the V's and W terms, um, they are basically the bare exchange and screen exchange terms. Um, so basically there are, um, there are basically two center integrals um, uh, with these uh, size being typically chosen to be the, the single particle wave functions that you obtain from a Kongshan, you know, DFD calculations. Um, so uh, the V terms involves V, which is basically bare Coulomb, 1 over R minus R uh, prime. And then the W term is a screened uh, Coulomb uh, operator that in involves some appropriately defined uh, dielectric operator. Okay. So um, these, you can think of them, these VA, VB, uh, WA, WB, you can think of them as four tensors. Um, but if you want to put them in a matrix here, you have to reshape, basically to reshape the the tensor um, into matrices. So um, to see how these um, 
you know, these force, uh, two center integrals are calculated. Maybe let's look at uh, maybe, you know, pr um, writing them down in terms of matrix notation. So I'm going to define these matrices of pair product states, okay? So, so M, MCC basically is a matrix that consists of a product of uh, conducting band, uh, single particle uh, orbitals or wave functions. And, and MVC is basically products of uh, the uh, valence and conducting, or occupied and unoccupied. MVV is the product occupied, okay? And then sometimes we work with the re reciprocal space uh, uh, representation, especially when we try to solve Poisson equations. Um, we turn them into reciprocal space by doing, performing a FFT. Um, so I use, sometimes use a hat to, re, uh, to represent the re reciprocal space representation. Okay, um, so in, in, if we write these um, uh, pair product states in, by M, then you can easily see that the, um, the VAs and v, WAs, for example, can be basically written as uh, a, a sequence of matrix matrix multiplication. Okay. Um, so where um, M is basically a fat, long uh, matrix, uh, V is a square matrix, and this is uh, M star is the transpose of it. Uh, and you can do uh, sort of this thing um, for um, VB and WB uh, in a similar fashion. So here we assume that a uh, number of uh, occupied or number of valence states, number of uh, conducting sta conduction band, um, unoccupied states, and the, uh, the number of grip points uh, in the uh, discretization of these wave functions, they're all proportional to number of electrons, just to make things, things somewhat simple, okay? Um, and, uh, and if you were to calculate this, these matrices directly, you'll see that because these M's contains basically uh, any square columns, um, so applying this V to that matrix basically uh, requires, to, requires performing N square uh, Fourier transforms. Okay, so, so that's uh, somewhat expensive. And then if you were to calculate this, these things as uh, matrix matrix product, uh, the number of operations that you have to perform is ultimately um, proportional to n e to the fifth power. Okay? So this is what you would do uh, if you were to do this uh, in a brute force fashion. Okay? Um, so we're going to do, try to actually um, uh, reduce the computational cost a little bit um, by using uh, what's called a low rank approximation. So remember that these, um, these Pair product states, these matrices of pair product states are, are in this shape. So this is, you know, the, the, the leading dimension is the number of grid points, either in the reciprocal space or real space. Uh, and then the, the number of columns is typically uh, a product of your know, number of occupied states and, and unoccupied states or number of occupied states, occupied states or unoccupied, unoccupied. So this is typically much larger than the leading dimension. So um, we can actually try to come up with a low rank representation by um, performing some kind of a truncated SVD um, where uh, U is the right singular vector, uh, S is a diagonal matrix with uh, a singular values that are significantly larger than you know, uh, zero, and then um, the C will be the uh, left singular vectors. And by, by doing this factorization, um, we can rewrite the, um, the M transpose VM as basically um, C times uh, this U transpose VU uh, times um, C, uh, where that just means that this, um, you know, when we try to solve Poisson equation, we don't have to actually solve N E squared Poisson equations. We basically only need to solve uh, uh, Poisson equations with the right hand side is defined in. in and U, um, um, and the number of columns, we hope that the number of columns in U is significantly less than NE squared, or NE even, um, or yeah, NG. So um, of course, you know, um, we can do this by singular value decomposition, but the cost of singular value decomposition for uh, this type of matrices is on the order of NE to the fourth, because the matrix is basically NE by NE squared, um, and then usually the, this SVD for that type of thing is basically uh, has this complexity, which is still somewhat high. So we'd like to reduce it down further to any, um, to the third power. Okay. So the way to do that um, is to um, 
use um, something called uh, uh, interpolative separable density fitting. So in SVD, the, the reason, part of the reason the SVD is very expensive is that we try to actually calculate um, both the right singular vectors and the left singular vectors at the same time. So in this um, in se in, in interpolative separable density fitting, what we do is we're going to fix one of the matrices by basically evaluating this um, pair product states at a set of interpolating points called, uh, in this case, called r hat mu. Okay? So that's, to some extent, it comes for free. And all we need to do then is to figure out, um, to some extent, the right singular vector, um, uh, what we call here uh, auxiliary bases. Uh, these are numerical auxiliary bases. Uh, since we only need to calculate that, uh, the problem becomes essentially a linear problem. Uh, so all we need to do is to basically um, solve, uh, to some extent, a linear fitting problem. Okay. Uh, so this idea was originally uh, developed by uh, Jean Fong Lu and, and Lex Yin in the context of uh, two electron integral evaluation. Um, so let's see how, how actually uh, the ISDF is, is uh, computed. Um, so what we do first is to pick a, uh, pick a set of interpolating points, r hat uh, mu, and evaluate the pair product states at these, uh, uh, and these interpolation points to give us this matrix C. And then we try to calculate the auxiliary bases, uh, this, you know, which is represented here by this matrix Xi, uh, basically by solving this minimization problem. We're minimizing the difference between the original pair product states evaluated at all uh, real space grid points uh, and the product of Xi and C. And the solution to that problem, uh, you can easily write down, is basically M times C transpose uh, times the inverse of C C transpose. Okay. However, if you were to solve if you were to solve this problem like this, uh, this is a brute force approach. Um, the cost will be somewhat high because the even the the matrix matrix multiplication, the M times C star uh, C transpose or C times C transpose, that cost will be uh, order n to the n to the fourth because these matrix elements, um, there are n e uh, matrix elements there and each matrix element takes n e square uh, operations to perform. Now, um, there is a way to significantly reduce the cost of doing that because um, these pair product states has a certain special structure, okay? Um, so basically what we can see that if you look at the, the the product of M and C star, if you look at one particular matrix element, uh, mu, new, uh, new mu, and you see that it's, it's an uh, um, inner product of these pair product states. Uh, and then each pair product states can be actually written as an inner product of these uh, single particle states. So by writing this long inner product as a product of two shorter inner products, um, you can actually reduce the cost of a single matrix element from order n square, n e square, to order n. Okay? So that allows us basically to reduce the cost of all these matrix matrix multiplications from order n to the fourth to um, order n to the third power. Um, another question that I haven't really mentioned is how do we pick the uh, uh, interpolation points? Okay? Of course, you can do this um, randomly um, in some fashion, but this is not optimal because if you were to pick this randomly, uh, you most likely will have to pick a lot of points for this approximation to be accurate. So ideally, uh, what we would li like to do is to pick these interpolation points so that um, the rows of the C matrix, which is basically this pair product states of value at this ex uh, extrapolate, uh, interpolation point to be maximally linearly independent, okay? Um, this can be achieved, for example, by using a QR factorization with column pivoting, or sometimes called the rank revealing uh, QR factorization. Uh, so what you do is you try to permute the, um, the rows of the, the, the pair product states uh, so that um, when you do the QR factorization, the diagonal of the R triangular factor will have a large elements. And we don't actually use the factorization itself. Um, the factorization returns, what's important is that the factorization returns this permutation matrix that tells you 
how to select uh, these rows of the pair product state. Okay? Um, but the, the rank, rank revealing or, or QR factorization with column pivoting is still expensive. It's, it's still order n e to the fourth. Um, to reduce that cost, you can use uh, what's called a randomized QR factorization, which is basically what you do is using this idea called sketching. You, you randomly select a rows of this uh, M matrix, uh, pair product state matrix, and, and take a smaller number of them and do a QR factorization. That allows you to reduce the cost down to n e to the third power. Okay. Um, so, and, and, uh, and that's, that's acceptable. Uh, and in most cases, that's what we use to, to do this kind of, uh, to pick the interpolation points. But for, um, for problems that we know a lot about, uh, another technique is to use the geometry of the problem. Um, basically use what's called the uh, centroidal uh, Voronoi tessellation um, to basically partition the domain, computation of domain, and select um, these interpolation points um, weighted, basically this can be done by uh, what's called k-means clustering, uh, weighted by the electron density of the molecule or solids. Okay, so this work was de developed by Ling and, and his collaborators uh, a couple years ago. So, um, now, once we have a, a efficient low-rank approximation, um, to actually make use of that low-rank approximation, um, we should combine that with the iterative solver, iterative eigensolver, uh, because if you were, if you have a low rank approximation and you were to form the original PLC matrix again by multiplying everything out, and then things are still expensive. Okay, so it, fortunately, uh, if we were, if we're try just trying to um, look at a few excitation energy, uh, we can use uh, what's called structural preserving Lanchos algorithm to, to compute these. Um, uh, eigenvalues of the BSE Hamiltonian. Or if you're interested in, in sort of the, the, um, you know, the general profile of the absorption spectrum, um, and, and you can actually also use the lower uh, Lanchos algorithm uh, to compute the absorption spectrum uh, without actually computing individual eigenvalues uh, explicitly. Okay. So uh, the key in, the, in using uh, these iterative algorithms is to keep these, um, the matrices VA, VB, in the uh, BSE Hamiltonian in the factored form um, so that we can possibly um, apply these uh, matrices. So in an iterative method, you know, the most, uh, the most expensive part is applying the Hamiltonian to a vector. So we keep these matrix terms in factor form so that when we apply the Hamiltonian to the vector, the cost of that becomes uh, uh, lower. So you can sort of see that if we keep the VA term, for example, in this factor form, applying that to a vector uh, basically involves uh, performing a sequence of matrix vector multiplications. So the multiplication of C and X cost order N to the third power, and VA times a vector also cost uh, about um, v, uh, N e to the square power, and so that cost can be kept, definitely kept low. So the W term is a little bit more complicated because it's, it's you know, originally it's a four tensor and you have to reshuffle things a little bit to get the uh, occupied state and occupied state in the right place. Um, but it turns out that you can actually do this also efficiently um, by refolding this um, vector X into a matrix and performing uh, this, these uh, matrix matrix multiplications by also uh, rearranging these um, uh, these occupy, uh, these uh, single particle orbitals as a matrix, and use a, a Hadamard pointwise uh, product to do the uh, application of W A to this uh, to this vector and reshape everything back into a vector after the multiplication. So that um, cost about order into the third power. So um, and and so that was for basically. Um, so I, I talked about this, how to do this for isolated system molecules um, first, and because it's easy. And then you can also do this for uh, periodic systems. Uh, and for periodic systems, um, these wave functions, uh, single particle wave functions, are are block waves. So you have a phase factor uh, play, uh, times a periodic function. And then when you calculate these kernels, um, these VA, VB, WA, WB. Um, 
In addition to the band index, the occupied state and occupied states, you have additional uh, index uh, representing the, uh, the K point, which is point in the uh, Berlin zone. Um, so for the V term, um, these, uh, these phase factors will cancel each other because the conjugation. Um, for the W term, uh, you will have an extra phase factor, but that's not really uh, an issue. Okay. So um, we can apply uh, the same ISDF technique um, to this um, uh, periodic system. Um, so this, this um, pair product state will become even longer because you, in addition to the uh, occupy and occupy indices, you have also K indices, okay? uh, two K indices. Um, but in practice, uh, in this field, that uh, for periodic systems, the number of occupied states and unoccupied states are typically chosen to be very, very small number compared to molecules. Um, and the number of K points uh, typically can be very large. Okay? So in this case, um, the dimension, the number of columns of this pair product states is dominated by actually the number of K points in this case. So, uh, in, in, for example, for the W term, uh, the number of columns is proportional to nk square, uh, whereas in the, for the V term, the um, number of pair products is proportional to nk. Okay? Um, so we, we try to do um, low rank of factorization, use ISDF again. Um, again, the, the key point is that we try to come up with the low rank representation with the, uh, the number of auxiliary bases um, is independent of the hope that this number of auxiliary bases is independent of nk, number of k points. And empirical, empirically, this is what we actually observe. And by doing that, this, is, this calculation can be done at this uh, cost, which is basically um, nq. Um, and uh, um, similarly, uh, you know, we can, we can apply it, um, once we have the ISDF factorization, uh, the multiplication of the Hamiltonian to a vector can be done um, relatively cheaply, um, basically by taking advantage of the structure of pair product states. So now let me give you some examples of how these things work in practice. So um, first set of examples are isolated systems. Um, um, so they're relatively small. Um, with you know tens of occupied states and occupied states, and the number of grid points is on the order of thousands uh, in the reciprocal space and tens of thousands in in the real space, and that gives the dimension of the uh, BSC Hamiltonian, which are the product of the uh, number of occupied and occupied states, uh, to be in the range of thousands. These are not terribly large, but they're already uh, indicates. Um, uh, how well uh, this low rank approximation idea works. Uh, just to check uh, how well can we uh, compress or uh, truncate the system, we, you know, perform uh, uh, trunc uh, SVD calculation for these pair product states, these M matrices. And you can see that um, the singular values of these matrices decay uh, very rapidly um, with respect to the number of uh, columns of this matrix. So for example, uh, for the pair product states for the uh, occupant and occupied, uh, the singular values get down to close to zero uh, in around some, somewhere around uh, 50. Um, so because the number of occupied states in, th in this case for the CO molecule is relatively small, so the, um, the decay is you know, somewhat um, slower, relatively speaking. So that allows us to basically uh, um, to, to figure out that actually the low rank of trun uh, uh, truncation can be very effective. So here, what we plot here is the error, uh, approximation error um, for the first eigenvalue of the BSE Hamiltonian. Um, so the error is basically the, uh, the eigenvalue that we computed in this Berkeley GW software by just constructing the, uh, the Hamiltonian, um, a full BSE Hamiltonian, uh, and diagonalize it. Uh, and then computing this uh, eigenvalue iteratively by using a ISDF low rank approximate BSE uh, Hamiltonian. And then we plot this error um, with respect to uh, the levels of truncations, where the level of truncation is defined as the ratio of the number of uh, auxiliary bases over the full dimension of the pair product states, okay? 
So we start with, for example, uh, point one, which basically means you throw away 90% of the, um, uh, the pair product states. Uh, and then you see that um, if we just um, do this for one N matrix at a time, you can sort of see that if we truncate VC or CC, um, we can actually get uh, 10 to the minus 3 Hartree error uh, when we throw away 90% of the occupancy. Of course, the accuracy will increase, I mean, the accuracy will improve if you truncate less and you keep more and more uh, auxiliary bases. Uh, in the case of uh, VV truncation for the uh, pair products of a VV, because it's, the VV is so small, um, you, have to, you have to actually have to keep quite a bit in order to uh, maintain sufficient accuracy. And not only is the first eigenvalue accurate, you can in fact calculate all the eigenvalues and see that um, you can get reasonable accuracy um, by keeping a truncation at about, you know, Point one level, which is basically you know uh, throwing away ninety percent of the um, uh, pair product states, and, and still maintaining about uh, ten to the minus three accuracy in the eigenvalue. And of course, with that, uh, we can also get the absorption spectrum, um, and they match pretty well for for these molecules. And it, in fact, we can actually truncate even more. We keep only you know point zero five, um, we keep only five percent. Um, uh, auxiliary bases and while still maintaining a pretty good profile for the absorption spectrum. And all the major peaks are identified. Uh, in, in, in some cases, the amplitude, the oscillator strength, is a little bit off, but it's not too bad. So in terms of the efficiency, um, what we did here is we um, measured the timing for constructing these ISDF uh, decomposition for these MCC and VC and, and VV. Um, if you see that um, for different truncation levels, uh, these are the different timings uh, for, for, uh, for, for constructing SDF. So if we um, keep the con um, truncation level for the VC pair product states of 0.1, which means we throw away 90% uh, VC pairs, uh, we keep 50% of the auxiliary basis for VV pairs, and and keep uh, only 10% of the auxiliary basis for the CC pairs, which is actually the, the larger uh, ones. Um, and then the speed up that we achieve is about 16, a factor of 16, okay? So that's compared to constructing these pair product states explicitly uh, without using any truncation. Uh, and then we can also look at the periodic system. We can look at diamond um, um, with, um, 13 times 13 times 13 uh, K points uh, in a unit cell that contains, you know, 20 to the cube uh, uh, real space grid points. Um, in a unit cell, there's four valence states, and, and we only pick 10 uh, conducting bands. Um, and then we um, choose these um, uh, truncation levels uh, and use the uh, exciting software to actually compute the um, absorption spectrum. What we see is that the, um, if we keep the error tolerance for the ISDF at 0.1, uh, we can actually get, already get a pretty good uh, uh, approximation of the absorption spectrum for the diamond. And if we uh, relax it a little bit more, uh, we still don't lose too much. Um, so, and this figure shows um, basically the, um, the accuracy of the ISDF approximation with respect to the truncation level. So, and you can see that uh, this point one basically corresponds to truncating over here, which is uh, very, very aggressive to some extent. And then also in terms of the efficiency for the periodic system, you can see that uh, this is, of course, you know, a relatively small system. It's implemented on a single node uh, on a laptop, basically. Um, and the ISDF construction takes about three minutes to do. Uh, whereas the conventional construction of the BSE Hamiltonian uh, takes actually quite a lot of time, um, even uh, a parallel uh, computers, uh, six hours on a, th on a system with 13 nodes and 13 cores per node. Uh, so this is a dramatic speed up um, uh, for actually constructing the Hamiltonian. And for solving, for calculating the absorption spectrum, it takes about 24 minutes to do basically to do all these matrix vector multiply. I think, I believe 150 of them, whereas the full diagonalization of the Hamiltonian takes about four hours. So this is uh, a lot faster. 
OK, now let me conclude. Um, so I talked about uh, using basically this uh, ISDF low rank approximation um, to sort of reduce the computational cost for uh, this um, for solving the BSC problem. And I think the, the reason uh, it works, uh, there are two aspects. Um, uh, so, so for both for isolated system and, and extended system. The reason that it works is twofold. I think, for, first of all, these pair product states, to some extent, uh, they, ca they contain redundant information. So that's, where, that's why the low rank approximation uh, can be useful, even though you know, these single particle states, of course, are often normal. Uh, they're full rank. But when you multiply them together, uh, they become linearly dependent. Okay. And secondly, I think what's important here is also this is different from sort of a traditional calculation. So BSC, all these many-body perturbation theory, they're approximation, they're approximate models, which means that the numerical solution only needs to be as accurate as the, the, uh, the accuracy level of the model. So you don't actually have to calculate you know, all these eigenvalues to last digit accuracy. So that's why all these things uh, work in this context. Okay, and I talked about um, you know, where the efficiency of ISDF come from. They come from the you know, efficient solution of the Poisson problem, reducing the number of um, auxiliary bases. They come from the careful selection of the interpolation points. And they also come from uh, being able to efficiently apply these um, uh, low, rep low rank representation of the operator to a vector due to the pair products uh, structure of these matrices. Uh, that's it. Thanks.